And now I'm excited to introduce everyone to our speaker today, Nathan Chung. Uh, Nathan Chung is a neurodiversity champion who is openly autistic with ADHD. And I'll let him add on to his experience and let him take it from here. Great, thank you, Sharon. Let me switch over. There we go. Alrighty, so uh, th thank you, thank you, Sharon, for the introduction. I'm so honored to be here today, and I will be talking about neurodiversity in tech, a subject that is popular today but still shrouded in mystery and neg negativity. So, more about me. So, sorry, back. Uh, sorry, uh, too much. So more, so so more about me. I am. Op I got. I was diagnosed with autism and ADHD just this past January, as despite suffering from these conditions from more than 40 plus years. I've been working in IT and tech for more than 20 years, and I have roughly 18 cyber and IT certifications. I'm also host of the Neurostick podcast, where I interview many extra extraordinary people who have neurodiverse conditions and help, help, help them to tell their stories. Now, what is neurodiversity? First, neurodiversity refers to variations in the human brain regarding sociability, learning, attention, mood, and other mental functions. Conditions include ADHD, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, Tourette's, and many more. Tourette's, sorry, neurodiversity affects everyone very, very differently. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. So neurodiversity affects everyone very differently. Some of the positive and negative traits are on the screen. Some positive traits include intense focus, being creative, strong attention de to detail, out of, the, out of the box thinking, and strong visual spatial skills. And the flip side, the negative traits, poor, poor social interactions, mental overload, poor eye contact, repetitive behaviors, and need, and the need for routines. People with these traits have been shown have been shown to be very to have a, a very unique, specialized expert ability to excel at IT and cybersecurity tasks. Yet, this, yet despite these advantages, there is a negative stigma around neurodiversity that makes it hard to hire and retain workers with neurodiverse conditions. A study in 2016 by the Autism Society. It showed that roughly 85% 85 unemployment rate for people with autistic, who, who, uh, for people who are autistic. Some of the problems in the workplace is, it, in my view, is essentially like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Many organizations, sadly, they view neurodiversity very negatively. They see it as a problem because they have a very I would like to say a, a factory mindset where all workers are expected to perform equally and at the same like similar productivity and without problem. Many managers and organizations even see accommodations as a burden. And I have sadly, I've heard way too many stories of people who have either lost their jobs because of their conditions or they cannot be hired for jobs in short, Corporate culture and organizations need to change to adapt to, uh, to neurodivergent people and their special needs. Okay, so starting off with career paths, having worked in IT and cybersecurity for more than 20 years, I've seen firsthand that the career paths are broken. They typically start, workers typically start at the entry level advance to mid-level, then on a manager and executive. The problem is many neurodiverse workers have, have a lot of uh, difficulties with social interaction. So it makes being a manager and going to management very difficult. 
and quite, quite frankly, like even for myself, like I, I do not aspire to be a manager at all, even though it's the natural progression and career path. And it's a kind of job that many, many desire and want. To, pick, to add to this, and what makes it worse is many organizations I've been at, they force you to choose that path. You see either you advance and promote, get promoted to manager or you lose your job. Things need to change. Job descriptions and career paths need to change, but it is very hard to do, but it is very possible, but we need to fight for change. Next, here is a quote from one of my favorite shows on Apple TV, it's called For All Mankind. It is a show about what, about that, that shows what could have happened if the Soviets slash Russians won the space race. So here's a quote. You are not what is called a team player. You have many strengths, intelligence, intuition, cunning, determination, nonetheless, now you have seniority, experience, impeccable credentials. So why were you passed over for, over for promotion? It is because you do not play the game. You resist forming the social bonds necessary to be seen as a team player, team member. Therefore, you are not and will never be seen as a team leader. So in my view, when I heard this quote on For All Mankind, it just struck home because so many people who are in nervous condition struggle with social interaction. So this quote alone, it really ramps on the point as to why many people with nervous condition struggle at work and to be promoted. To help visualize these points, just imagine these two people, Mr. X on the left. So everyone would know that, so he is from uh, that, Netflix show Atypical. And I would say there are many people, including myself, would represent Mr. X. So Mr. X is, has neurodiverse conditions and is very, very, uh, he's, a, he's a high performer and he's very productive. Compare that to Mr. Y on the right, who does not have neurodiverse conditions. He's a life of the party and he has tons of friends. So compared to the two, Mr. Y is a fun guy at the happy hour and people just like him. He's like, he has a he's strong sociability. Unfortunately, this also illustrates a huge barrier for many people such as myself in the workplace because company organizations and companies have historically, systematically and, his, and naturally have promoted Mr. Y or Mr. X. Like I've seen it myself and I've been this is a roadblock I myself face. Things need to change. So for, to help fix, fix this and to help organizations uh, to hire and retain more no, no diver, divergent workers, here's, uh, here's my tips for it. Here's my fixes. Number one, the job descriptions need to be fixed. Many job descriptions today use terms such as good team player or need to have excellent communication skills. Many neurodiverse people, such as myself, are very literal. So if you say you, we, when the job description says you want X, like say a, a ninja or a coding, like say for example, a coding ninja, for people such as myself, neurodivergent diver, people such as myself, many of them are very literal. So when we see that in a job description, we take that literally. So the job description needs to be accurate and welcoming and to eliminate terms as good team player or ex ex excellent communication skills. Because th those types of words will automatically uh, turn away people just myself from even applying from jobs. So the job descriptions need to be fixed. Number two is the interviews. Many people who do interviews have not usually are not trained on how to interview neurodivergent people, so they need training. Next, accommodations. What a lot of people, in myself, do not realize often do not realize is when going to job interviews, 
we, we can very much ask for accommodations and the accommodations are very important to make, to make the person being interviewed feel comfortable. Some of the ones I've seen are things like changing the environment or even most importantly, doing the, uh, doing the interview online through like, say Zoom or Teams. Another way, another accommodation is also even something as simple as lighting. Many people who are neurodivergent have sensitivity to lights and sounds. And most importantly, what I've seen is some organizations will even have panel interviews where you would have, like, say, five or six people interviewing the candidate all at the same time. For people such as myself who, who have a lot of anxiety, panel interviews are a nightmare. So to help make the neurodivergent candidate more com comfortable, it's best to eliminate the panel interview altogether and to do it one by one. In addition, provide breaks. Like even when I do myself and I do interviews or podcasts, I usually cannot last more than an hour. It is very exhausting and many neurodivergent people clean myself would have mental overload. So breaks are crucial, but most importantly of all is to help make the interview person being interviewed feel comfortable. Number three is workplace accommodations for when the person is hired. Many people are afraid to even ask for these accommodations because they don't want to disclose that they have no diverse conditions, but it is so crucial for people, not just people who are no diverse, but anyone to essentially be free and, and able to ask for what you need to survive and thrive in the job. Some of the common workplace accommodations I myself have requested and others I've heard stories about include, number one is having a headset. Many people such as myself are very sensitive to a lot of noise, especially something as simple as workers talking or walking around, around the workplace. So those are very distracting. So a headset allowing a worker to focus on their job is very important, but I need to emphasize that each individual is different. So a person, when some, some people might benefit from a headset, others will not. Another accommodation is having a flexible work or even working from home. In fact, with the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us who are neurodivergent have gained and have thrived in our job because we are allowed to have a flexible working schedule and working from home. Another accommodation I've heard from others is the placement of their desk. I remember a story from uh, one lady I heard that where she suffered because her desk was right next to the entrance. So she would often <laughs> hear people coming and going and or hearing the doors open close, which is very distracting. Her productivity improved tremendously when she asked for her desk to be moved to another area, which is that did not have as many distractions. Another accommodation I've heard that works is having meeting captions. Even for those who do not have issues, there are people who will benefit, not just neurodivergent people, but also those who are deaf or hard of hearing or those who just need some extra time. So they will benefit from captions. And best of all is if company or organizations do not even consider Turning, on, turning them on or off, just turn them on by default. The workforce will benefit greatly from that. Another workplace work accommodation is, that should be a no-brainer, but doesn't come often, is just take, being able to take a break. Especially working in a tech and cyber field, we, uh, people such as myself, we are often stuck in front of the computer literally all day without taking a break because Work is busy, but it is crucial, not just for mental health, but for our physical health and our psychological health to take frequent breaks and just step away from the computer once in a while. 
Another combination that is very helpful is to pro for managers to provide for workers clear written instructions. I myself, I suffer from auditory processing issues. So sometimes it's hard for me to follow, uh, 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 follow sp sp spoken instructions, especially if it's like say six or seven steps, this, I just get lost in the crowd. But having written instructions, that helps. It really helps. But most importantly, every worker, whether they're neurodivergent or not, or no matter what, who they are, every worker has needs and they should be able to speak up and ask for what they need to survive and thrive in the job. Number four, cor corporate culture needs to change. For starters, they need to be more welcoming and to address the negative stigma. Like for example, I've heard way too many stories from friends where managers and coworkers would belittle them or make fun of them or treat them, treat, uh, treat, the, treat the person quite horribly because they're, uh, because they're no diversion, no diverse condition and that, that is sad. I myself have experienced the same in some organizations, which is, it's a huge barrier for many people who are neurodivergent because I wouldn't want, want to work for an organization that allows and tolerates bullying, would you? I certainly don't. Another piece that's so important is training for the managers. At many organizations, managers often follow a, what I like to call a command and control mindset or quite simply, monkey see, monkey do. Many managers just follow and do things pretty much the same way as they've been taught from other managers or their friends. So many, many managers, quite frankly, do not know how to manage a neurodivergent person. And ma man getting management training to address that is crucial. Or at that crude level, just having empathy or asking a neurodivergent person, what do they need? Like, Sometimes many people are just afraid to ask for what they need. So the change to flip, to flip that around, a manager could just, instead of waiting, just go and ask their, uh, uh, their workers, what do you need? What can I do to help? Just asking that can, be, can, be, can open a door and potentially make things a lot more, uh, make, make the workplace a lot more friendly. Another piece of it is instead of focusing on what a worker cannot do, focus on what they can do and look at their strengths and recognize them. Another piece is provide accessibility tools for everyone. The, the captions are a huge example where you don't need to have a disability or be deaf or hard of hearing or be neurodiverse. Just turn on the captions and other accessibility tools and make them available. Everyone will benefit from them, from them. And most importantly is to eliminate negative bias and hostility in a workplace. The bullying piece I, I, I mentioned is, is sadly, very, it, it still happens in many organizations. So in my view, managers and executives need to step up. When you see such activity when, or you even suspect it, it needs to be addressed and not tolerated because quite simply think about it. If a, one person was pushing you around and thinking you or treating you as lesser than, is that okay with you? It's not okay with me. So in my view, the, the managers, especially in the execs, they need to step up and protect the workers. If you, if you see these things happening, if you see bullying, workplace uh, bias or a bullying happening to, to anyone, speak up and address it and take corrective action. Fix number five is the career paths. Career paths are often very difficult to change, especially larger organizations, but it is not impossible. Career paths, in my opinion, it should be changed so that people such as myself who do not, who do not uh, want to be a manager can still pursue a technical path to say an architect or, or a uh, high-end engineer. 
any, essentially any job that allows us to thrive in a technical field and not have to manage people. If you do that, maybe people will see my stuff will thrive and be very happy and, and it'll be at companies many, many, for many years to come. Another piece to it is to eliminate the requirements to, to become managers because even though many neurodivergent workers so, suffer with social interaction and are, have a hard time being a manager, it is still possible to manage people. I myself have been put in positions where I do, did manage people and I was really good at it, even though I was very uncomfortable, but I was still able to do it and do it well. Another piece is quite simply to ask workers, what are their career goals and aspirations? Where do they see themselves in a few years? <laughs> because quite simply, neurodivergent people, such as myself, we struggle with social interaction. So more times than not, many of us who have neurodiverse conditions will be even too caught up in our work to even think about what we want to do in the future. We, we just, sometimes we just want to stay in our own little bubble and just keep doing what we're doing. That there's nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, everyone, literally everyone has hopes and dreams and those should be explored. And most importantly, important of all is to provide clear and transparent paths for advancement. At many organizations I've seen, the bias and negativity to neurodivergent workers, it is so strong that many do not even see where the career paths even are, which is sad. Number fix number six is to go all in. Sadly, many organizations I see, even those that tout and celebrate their neurodiversity hiring practices, many of them are flawed because they create neurodiverse only teams separate from the organizations instead of including them in the whole. In my view, and this will probably be seen as very controversial, this, this is a mistake. Because if a neurodivergent worker is siloed and, and is not integrated with the team as a whole, they will feel left out and they will still feel the negative bias and discrimination because they are excluded from the other teams. Teams need to be inclusive. Another, another thing to do is that as they go down this route, companies that promote neurodiversity in the workplace, it needs, it needs to be, they really do, even they need to go all in. It should not be a temporary initiative just for marketing purposes. Like when some of these organizations announce that they have these neurodiversity hiring programs, it looks great, it looks wonderful, but it needs to, they need to go all in and make the teams inclusive and make it so that it is not a temporary thing. And the diversity inclusion efforts to include more people is, it needs to continue. And, and, and for the long term, but at the root cause, since everyone is different, everyone's needs, needs need, need, they need to be met for the long term. And number seven, and this is perhaps the most powerful and most difficult fix of all because it comes down to the heart of each individual is self-acceptance. Because quite frankly, if we as individuals cannot accept who we are, no diversion or not, it's, it is harder for others to accept us. So it all starts with ourselves. Like we have to accept who we are. For myself, in my uh, journey to getting diagnosed with autism, autism and ADHD, th these are some of the things I did to gain self-acceptance. I did some tests online because there are a lot of websites out there to where you can get evaluated and go through the similar through, through a lot of criteria to help you to determine if you have a neurodivergent condition. So their tests are online and they are free. There are, there are also books out there where you can read stories of people, of other people who are neurodivergent. In fact, there are many, many, many people out there throughout the world and throughout history who have neurodiverse conditions 
or are suspected of having them to like Einstein, Mozart, even Susan Boyle from American Idol. Another piece to it is get support from friends. Many people with neurodiverse conditions, myself, we often isolate and live in shame because we don't want, uh, don't, don't, don't we just reject help from friends because we're so depressed and so sad that to have a neurodivergent condition that is hard to reach out for help. My suggestion, big tip looking back is for the other people, don't wait for a friend to reach out to you. You should reach out to them. Just, uh, just, you know, just think of those, pick up the phone or send an email, just ask how are they doing, it's all it takes. Because once you do this and like myself, once you learn, like for me, once I learned I have a neuro, I'm neurodivergent and I have autism ADHD, I did find peace after many, many, many decades of hostility and conflict within myself. Finding that peace is so crucial because with my autism and ADHD diagnosis, it literally felt like the mental chains that kept me depressed and that, that held me back was gone. I was free to be myself and th that felt good. Yep, and thank you. And that, that's all I got for today. And here is my contact information, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, and the link to my Neurosec podcast for anyone who wants to listen. And yep, that, that's it for me. And uh, we have some time for some questions. That was amazing. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, um, I, it's time for any questions that um, anyone has. Just feel free to uh, mute yourself. Um, this is kind of a small, intimate uh, event. So you can just uh, mute and ask any questions. Um, and yeah. Mute away. Hey, Nathan. Uh, I, I really wanted to thank Hello. you for sharing all that. That's a ton of info. And, uh, you know, part of why I came today is because, like, I am wearing headphones <laughs> and I do like quiet spaces. Um, but I also find myself to be, like, really social. So, you know, I don't expect to be requesting professional advice from you on these kinds of things um so for now at least i just wanted to express a lot of gratitude i think like your story is pretty interesting and inspiring thank you so, thank you thank you and like i said everyone's different all because a person is neurodivergent or have these conditions it affects everyone literally differently in fact i've met many people who are neurodivergent and you would never suspect that they, they would look perfectly normal Dude, you would never know. Yeah, maybe maybe one question because you've you've gotten really deep into this and you're speaking about it. Um, do you know if there's like organizations that are in I don't know Canada, or the U.S. or B.C. that are kind of um, particularly responsible for trying to help employers uh, like get their feet wet? on this because oh, like I know HR Ooh. as a department is just blowing up right now for so many reasons including but not limited to the pandemic hmm. but on neurodiversity like where would an employer even start Ooh, that's a good question at a high level it it depends because there are many organizations nationally and internationally that advocate for neurodiversity but to try to avoid the controversy, I, I would leave everyone else to, to do their own research. For example, there are some organizations that favor things like ABA, or the drug shock therapy, or even uh, eugenics, or even like treating autism as an illness that needs to be wiped out. I will not name names, but that's example. That is why for a lot of people, they, they need to do their own research. Because I met people on both sides of the aisle who were for and against those kinds of treatments and view and that those views of no diversity, but 
all you need to do is uh, like Google like neurodiversity and uh, companies or, or employer. And you'll see a lot of, you see a list of many companies who are openly hiring neurodivergent workers. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Yeah. Um, I know even just for myself, this neurodiversity term, I haven't really been hearing that much about it. So this is a very informative um, topic with even some useful tips, like some people have um, asked about, you know, what are some ways to diversify the hiring process and the workplace? And you have mentioned some of that, Nathan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe like just one more question, but if not, we can... I'm nervous about putting my camera on because I'm like literally in my bedroom here it's and okay. I have bad signal, but hi. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been really helpful. I've, um, I've been a hiring manager for about 10 years and I confess that I do not do a good job of this um, kind of diversity on my teams. And one of the things I was wondering is some of the, some of the materials that you had in your presentation, have you like written those anywhere else that you could send us a link to so that we can um, share it with our networks? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah I can. Great, thank you. I do. I think that there's enough in there to like get started for sure. But it's um, you know, it's a long journey, and I know I talk a lot in when I write articles about cognitive diversity on teams, mm. and I started to use that term instead of instead of just diversity because I think that it's um, I think diversity means certain things to certain people, and I think cognitive yes. diversity is a little bit broader, and so. I've recently made that shift myself. So I'm really glad to be here today. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you brought up an interesting point because sadly for neurodiversity, the biggest demographic of all that get, I think is ignored are women. Because everyone in the, how you say, historically neurodiverse conditions such as autism, people tend to think it only affects white males. So if you're not a white male, like for me, I'm Asian, so I'm not white. So people would never think of me as having it or even worse are women of color. They, 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 they often are ignored when they have these conditions. Wow. And I've met many people who have su literally, literally suffered throughout their entire lives, but like in their, some of my friends in the UK, she's in her fifties and she just got her diagnosis a few years ago. And even for that, it's like, it frees them. Like instead of like, wondering for their entire life, what is wrong with me? Why do people think I'm quirky? You, you can think of it more like, when you have a worker, you have a normal worker A, but normal worker, worker B excels at their job and, can be, is a, and is a specialist, so they're not the same. The problem is many organizations treat them as the same and say, oh, person B, you need to be more like A, just fall in line. But if you think about them more like as specialists, why would you want your specialists to slow down? <laughs> if they're doing a really good job, they should be encouraged to keep doing it. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Yeah, also just to add on, um, I will be posting some of these slides, um, this whole meeting on YouTube, but also I'll send some slides to everyone who signed up today. Um, and yeah, and everyone feel free to contact Nathan, um, the contact that he's given on LinkedIn, Twitter. He's like, he's also part of the um, women in cybersecurity group. I know he hasn't mentioned that yet, but yet. <laughs> yeah, he's doing a lot of work. So yes, any Thanks. more questions? Um, I have one. Sure. Um, so first, thank you for um, this presentation. It was great. Um, I, I definitely hate panel interviews as well. So yes. that would make things better for everyone. <laughs> um, my question was, I, I know like a lot of workplaces also try to have like a social aspect or like they do like, I don't know, like team um, meetups and things like that. But I, I, I was wondering, are there like accommodations that uh, workplaces should, should think of for those social events that they try to do as well? Hmm, you have a good point. And that was uh, one of the topics of my slides. That is a huge barrier for no diversion people like me because companies, they're gonna wanna hire you know, the person who's social, who's great and fun, who enjoys happy hours. And, th and that is really a, a bias. So unfortunately there is no real accommodation per se, but because for, like, for me, when I go, I get overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed, like say a happy hours from the lights and the noise is, 
it literally sometimes caused me to shut down. So unfortunately there is no accommodation per se for that, but I think it also comes down to the interaction with the manager. If your manager understands that you have these conditions and you're not comfortable with happy hours, I think it's important for them to understand that. That way they can say, okay, we'll focus on your work or focus on other things. But on the flip side, it is very dependent on the corporate culture because if that's how they feel, if they're gonna promote and decide who to promote based on who's fun is happy hours, that says a lot about their corporate culture. And it, I, w- I would not wanna work for a company like that who promotes only because of that. Now, another thing I need to bring up that I talked about in one of my podcasts is how no- these neurodiverse conditions are, it is even more painful for those who, those of us who are like you and me who are Asian, because in Asian countries, the, the families have literally hundreds, if not thousands of years of Confucian thought and history and society ingrained in their families. And that says, especially in the Asian family, it, it, it says essentially, if you have these conditions, do not talk about it, do not mention it and just get by somehow. So as a result, many, people who are Asian, they struggle with these conditions. And sadly, it's, it, does lead to some, it does lead to some people to commit suicide because they can't talk about it. They cannot get help. <laughs> so I talk about that in my podcast where it's people don't even think about the, how, how impactful family, history, culture, even how, uh, how these conditions are seen in various countries. Because in some countries, it is the negative stigma is even worse than the U.S., very worse. Yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, Asian cultures can be very repressive. Yes. I like, want you to fit in that box. Exactly. Capabilities, and if you don't, it's like, you, exactly. just, have to, you just have to find a way. <laughs> yes. But yeah, I talk about that in my podcast, yeah. because it is very, mm-hmm. it's like, it's bad enough, hard enough in the office, but to not get any help, from, from, from uh, your own family, it is very damaging. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yep, thanks. Yeah, and Maura even said how the happy hour challenge, um, huh. she also made sure that her other events weren't centered on drinking alcohol to make it more inclusive. Yep, that's wonderful, um, um, Marna, thanks for sharing. But yeah, the, it does all come down to the corporate culture because sadly, many corporate cultures, they, that's how they do things. They love to drink and have fun. And it's, it, it comes down to an individual, individual choice. Like, since I'm not comfortable, I would choose not to work at such places.